Hi everyone, it's Natalie here. So um, I'm here this morning doing a VR to uh, Queen Osset of Oya's Girl and Christina. And <clears throat> they did, if you haven't seen it, they did a really fantastic video um, conference and then like recorded it talking about the um, the new Kali deck that's coming out that's made by um, Alana Fairchild and a male artist whose name escapes me. I think it's James something. It's in their video. They speak about it at great length and detail. I highly recommend it. It's an excellent critique. It's very fair, very reasonable, um, and they raise some excellent points about the issues involved in creating a deck like that without any appropriate research. Part of me wants to buy the deck because I'd like to look at it in more detail to be able to pinpoint the areas where where I see a, a, a major gap um, <clears throat> with between the art. You know, obvious. It's obvious when you watch when you watch their video. It's obvious. The gaps are so significant between what the artist has done and what the author has written, um, but also between just there just seems to be a disconnect and a lack of understanding about what they're talking about um, or what they're trying to do. And it's very misleading um, for practitioners. I don't work with Kali as a, as a deity so much as I work with uh, another form of Kali uh, adopted by the Tibetans known as Troma Nyangmo. Um, and Troma is essentially is essentially Kali. Um, this is a depiction of Troma, and you see that she even writes Kali Troma um at the bottom here as <clears throat> as Laura Santi, who is the artist. This comes, let's see, I should show you the deck. This comes from Buddha Wisdom Shakti Power, okay, by Laura Santi. Um, she's very good. She actually is a practitioner as well as an artist and she has trained with um, with Tanka artists and, and Indian artists, both Tibetan and you know Indo-Tibetan um, religious artists. And this particular depiction is from a larger uh, Tanka that she painted for Westerners to use in their Chud practice because the most of the um, Tankas that are available that are related to Chud, which is is one of my main practices, um, are they're just they seem a little bit inaccessible to Westerners. So using what she knows of Eastern tradition uh, and working with those traditional masters and Western um, understandings, she then merged them to create a really amazing Tanka. Um, I will also include the link to her work so that you can see the picture of the whole tanka and so forth in the in the uh, box below. Um, I like my resources. I tend to try and include as many of them as I can. That said, even Laura Shanti gets certain things a little bit off or wrong um, depending on what your practice is. So it's clear to me as a practitioner looking at this um, depiction of, of trauma, for example, that her practice is a little different. I'll tell you why. Um, and I took, <laughs> so this is a little scattered, but so I took a lot of notes while I just pulled out my, like, you know, I was sitting, I was like, where am I, where's my chunk of, you know, recycled paper notes that I can use. Um, and I sat and scribbled notes as I was listening, uh, to Queen Osset and Christina talking about this. Um, there's just so much there. So, First of all, let's just say this much, right? The style of the artwork is what is debatable. Um, scratch that. I got it wrong. I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> I just read it wrong. So let me just say that again. It's not the style of the artwork used. It's the iconography, right? So um, let me just explain that in greater detail. Here's why this is important. This is a book filled with depictions of different deities that I work with 
right, that are in great detail. Tons and tons and tons, hours of time in Tibetan practice, in tantric practices, and I'm going to go into tantra in a second because that's another misunderstood area that they raised as, as being problematic. Um, and it's always been problematic. And this is a thing that, that Westerners have issues with <laughs> understanding um, tantric Buddhism. Um, but, you know, the, we spend hours devoted to <clears throat> discussing the appearance and the iconography and symbolism of each of these deities that we work with. Why? Because what we're practicing is deity yoga. So if you're someone who's ever practiced like Western yoga, right, where you go to the nice studio and you start, you know, with the Anjali Ma uh, Mudra and take a sun breath in, out, right, sun salutations, and so you're practicing a form of Tantra, okay? It's got its roots in um, an Indian Tantra. Um, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to the Tantra part, right? We're not, it's obviously not just about sex, Obviously, not just about sex. And I'm, I promise I'm going to get there. Um, when practicing, when practicing deity yoga, right, you have to know what it is that you're supposed to see. You have to know what it is that you're focusing on, um, what it is that you need to visualize. The purpose of this has many, many different, well, it has many purposes, right? And, and it all depends, too, on which, which deity you are uh, visualizing and what the purpose of that practice may be, okay? So that's a part of it, too. The reasoning behind that, um, my teacher, and I found it in here this morning. I was going back through my notes here um, from Lama Sultram. The reasoning behind that is because as human beings, we have a tendency to project anyway, right? We're going to do it. We're just going to do it. Um, and, and in many respects, a large portion of the problems that we're looking at right now, right, and in, in our culture, especially in the United States, are a result of that projection, okay? When you're working in deity yoga, you want to work with a, pro a form of projection that's constructive and useful, and which is going to bring you closer to deity. And these forms of deity, the symbols used, the way they're depicted, are thousands of years old in some cases, right? They've been around forever. The reason it's important is because that is the lineage, right? Those are the lineages through which this wisdom has been passed. And the ways in which uh, lineages in, certainly in Tibetan, and I would say, I would say in, obviously in Indian um, as well, uh, in Indian culture and religion, they're, they're very, they overlap in many ways, and there's ways in which they completely depart from one another. So I, and I'm not as familiar right now um, with the Indian side of this, so I do want to offer that very specifically and, and just be, be straightforward about that. Um, but the, the, the ways in which these depart from one another is important um, because the ways that those, that those deities are being depicted is specific to a lineage and to a way of understanding deity energetically, visually, symbolically, um, and through sound. Sanskrit is such an amazing language. So one thing that, um, that, that Queen Osset points out in her video is that the very back of the card, of this Kali card, um, there is a, a, a bija mantra, and it's Kali's bija mantra. So if you are calling to a specific deity, one major significant way in which we do that is through the use of sound. And it's so complex, I don't know where to start or if it's even necessary um, to explain all of that. If that's something you want to know more about, please say something in the comments and I will do my best to, um, you know, elucidate on that a little further. But that is, it's very, you know, all of those things come together in order to invoke 
that deity. We invoke the deity, bring the deity into our visual space, right, and into our imaginal space, projecting them into space in order to then unite with them. So after calling them in and invoking them, we then uh, dissolve them into their, you know, into their bija and then just into the form of pure light, bring them into our bodies where they then dissolve completely. And then they reemerge, okay, and we reemerge as that deity and then practice as that deity in some form. I hope that makes sense. So it's an energetic, psycho, highly psychological, um, magical practice in order to do this. And a huge component of the way that that's done happens through the iconography. So how can you get to know a deity um, or an aspect of deity, right? Because there are some deities who uh, are, are definitely aspects of one another, right? Uh, there's no mistaking that, that uh, Troma and Nangmo, and I, you know, they, whoever edited the deck decided that we needed to specify that this is also Kali, I guess to make it more, this is one of my problems with this deck. It doesn't just stick specifically to the imagery and intelligence and wisdom that is held by the author. It then kind of, it's, it's not a great deck. The, uh, nothing wrong with the artwork. The artwork's brilliant. The, you know, the translation of it is not. But uh, there's another video I made about this. I'll probably put the link to that somewhere. But the, um, it, yeah, suffice it to say, she's clearly an aspect of Kali, right? This this image of, of trauma. Um, similarly, I'd be curious to know um, within that deck that we were, that we were looking or talking about, whether um, whether Vajravarahi is also included, um, and if so, in what form? Because there are a lot of ways of depicting uh, Vajravarahi depending on uh, various different circumstances. Here's one where she's a little bit more wrathful. Okay, um, <clears throat> that that's important. That tells us something very specific about what part of Vajravarahi we're invoking. She is also often um, conflated or associated with uh, with Trump, uh, with uh, uh, Kali. So I'm just curious about that. Again, this is a completely different art style. It's very similar to you know an Indo-Tibetan art style, but it's also very clearly the author's own art style. Um, Another deck that was that was brought up uh, in the video was the um, Dark Goddess Tarot by Ellen Lorenzi Prince. I love her so much, um, <clears throat> and very specifically, um, Queen Osset pointed out uh, the the depiction of Dumavati, who is a crone driving a chariot with no with no one to pull it. Right, occasionally it's pulled by the two crows. Often she's depicted as not having anyone there to pull her, um, her chariot, right? The iconography, you know, the, the art style is unimportant. This is incredibly simplistic, and yet it completely conveys what is needed and intended and what gives you the sense of, uh, of who Dumavati is, you know, what her traditional iconography is. You can then look up the symbols you can look up further information. If you develop a, a deep connection to her, you now have the tools to do that, right? Um, it's a, a brilliant introduction. Similarly, let's see, um, more praise and love of, uh, and she does have another one here of, of Kali. Again, my knowledge of Kali is not great. I have just enough to be dangerous. And I say that in, a, in the sense that I could easily, uh, you know, misappropriate her, but I do have knowledge of of the more, you know, the Tibetan side of that particular deity known as Troma, okay, as as Troma Nangmo, um, and of Dakinis. And Troma is generally depicted as a Dakini, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, but here is a blue Dakini. This is an excellent um, depiction. Again, it's Ellen Lorenzi Prince's um, depiction of her, and it's this is the, um, sorry, I've got stuff everywhere here. Um, this is the deck that was created um, 
this is the indie deck. Here is another um, blue dakini. This is the Vajra dakini. It's the same thing. She's the same same dakini. Here she's not depicted with the extra arms. Oh, whoops, with um, Laura Shanti. She's depicted in a much more traditional fashion. Okay, and again, I'll, I'll show you kind of what, what, why, how here in a minute. So let's just talk about dakinis for a minute because troma is a form of dakini. So I pulled out all the dakinis in, um, in Laura Shanti's deck here because there are many. Oh, and here's another dakini. This is another Ellen Lorenzi Prince dakini. You're going to notice in a second that it's completely different than any other depiction of dakinis that I'm going to show you. And it is not problematic. And I will tell you why that is also the case. Okay. Even though it's not exactly the same iconography. There's something specific that she's pointing to there that's, you know, we'll get to that. So <clears throat> here is the Vajra Dakini, as I said. So a Vajra, by the way, is this. This is also called a Dorje in um, Tibetan. So Vajra is the Sanskrit word. Dorje is the Tibetan word. Um, so all Dakinis, as you're going to see here, are depicted similarly. Here we have the Kartika knife. This one has a chud drum, Vajravarahi. Uh, here's Vajravarahi more as a dakini. Again, Kartika. Where's mine? I have one. Oh, similar to the one I've got here, right? And also similar to the one I always wear around my neck, right, or around my throat. I, I very rarely am without it. Um, she carries a skull cup. And she has a, um, a katvanga staff, okay? And they're always dancing on top of a body. Um, in this case, you know, the body represents the ego. So in, in so, and, and severance or, you know, severance of attachment to the human body, to the physical body, um, and the need, you know, the, the need to maintain the body in a way that's, that is delusion, you know, delusory, um, and unhelpful, right? She's always, she's surrounded by fire again, because she is fierce. She is, um, semi wrathful or wrathful, and she's going to cut some, she's going to cut some shit. She's going to cut it hard. Further, further detail on all this in a minute. Here we have another one. Again, you see the same thing, the leg lifted in the dancing posture. This is the lion-headed dakini. And then we have further five family wisdom dakinis. So they have the ratna dakini. These dakinis are less terrifying, but they still have a sun disc behind them. She's depicting them as sort of semi-wrathful. The ones from the tradition that I practice with, and I'll show you the practice images here in a minute, are, are definitely wrathful. Um, they're always depicted on a sun disc. Sun discs are wrathful by nature in the Buddha Dakini. Um, and then this one is very similar, but this is the fierce uh, Purva re, uh, wielding blue Dakini. So instead of a Kartika, she's got a Purva, which is a very different uh, implement. It's like a dagger, but it does not cut, it stabs, right? It, it marks something or it stops something. You know, it's very specific. Uh, and finally, the Karma Dakini. That's in the Green Karma family. And then we're back. Yeah. So the, obviously, the iconography of Dakinis is is pretty consistent. So you can see here instantly, okay, we're probably looking at a Dakini. She's carrying different things. Okay. But we still have, in the same way, we still have the skulls. Um, we still have a lot of the same ornaments. I don't know if you can see that. Those are human heads um, and human bones skulls, um, etc. And in her, in her, um, left hand, she carries a, uh, um, wow, what a brain fart to have a Kongling. That's a Kongling. So it's a human thigh bone trumpet. And then in this hand, she's got a, a body that she's wielding and, you know, clearly, you know, violently ready to, yeah, you get the picture. So she, you know, it's not that these are violent deities, right? Understanding deeply what's going on here is the whole, this is the whole practice. Working with what it gives you, what arises inside of you is part of the whole practice. 
um, being with the fear that it invokes is part of the whole practice. Learning to work with your own anger, with your own rage, with your own um, ugliness, right? Your own inner ugliness um, is part of the practice. Why? Because this practice is at its very root tantric. Now let's go into this tantra part, right? Let's let's talk about that. So um, the word tantra, I took this, again, I'm going to link the, the article below. It's a really good article, very worth reading if you're at all interested in tantra um, or in Buddhism or feminism or feminism and Buddhism and the way they intersect. Um, so the word tantra, it's derived from the Sanskrit word tantrum, meaning loom, warp, or figuratively, groundwork, system, doctrine. Okay, so where uh, where tan means to stretch or extend. So what we're doing in Tantra and in Tantra practice is we're weaving together everything in existence. We're weaving together, you know, it's a non-dual practice. We're weaving together, you know, the good and the bad. We're weaving together the black and the white. We're weaving together, then once we begin to see that those two things can weave together, we can find shades of gray. We're then weaving all of those threads and strands together in there as well. Okay, we're, we're pulling everything in existence, overlapping dimensions, right? Um, everything in cosmology, spiritual, physical, material, um, etheric, all of it and we're anchoring it in your in our physical bodies and we're anchoring it right here right now in this time in this space why because we're we are as you can see through the threads right the word sutra Right? We think of Kama Sutra. That's another word that bothers me. The word Sutra means thread. So lots of weaving analogies, right? Lots of threading and weaving that goes on, right? Of taking something from here, something from here. How do they connect? And through doing that, we begin to understand that there is no separation between here and there, right, on an absolute level. On a relative level, there is, obviously. <laughs> we all arise in our separate shapes and our separate forms, um, you know, and, in, in, and with this uh, incredible sense of separateness. But we practice uh, deity yoga, and more specifically, um, we practice something like chud, right? This comes from the chud practice, because we are in a way finding the way to sever that sense of separateness through becoming less attached to the physical body, okay, or the ego. I don't tend to use and like to use the word ego or severing the ego or cutting the head to sever the ego um, because when we start doing that, it, it gives rise to all of this guilt and shame um, and it tends to lead in a lot of people to a sense of spiritual bypassing. And that's something that I found to be incredibly um, distressing and upsetting in my practice. Um, having worked with a lot of Buddhists um, from other traditions, not so much in the tantric tradition, though it is a big problem in the tantric traditions as well. Um, more, I more encountered that in the, in the Zen traditions that I was working within, unfortunately. Um, and that's not all, not all Zen people are that way. Certainly it was just my personal experience of it, but the tendency to spiritually bypass in order to um, be good to be perceived as good, to be less egoic, um, all of that sort of thing. It was really rife and it was painful. Um, how are we doing on time here? I'm going on a bit, but that's okay. Um, yeah, it's it, it was it was very problematic and pa very painful. It doesn't work, 
right? To be, to be, to spiritually bypass doesn't work well. So rather than saying ego, um, because of where that can lead, um, either in terms of shaming others or in terms of shaming oneself, um, you know, again, feeling judged, needing to, needing to eradicate that which is bad or that which is undesirable from ourselves, etc. That is not the point. <laughs> That's not the point of should. Okay. That is, that is actually not where it's going. So where is it going? Let's talk about where is it going? What's the point? What are you doing? Um, let's see. Okay. So where is it going? It's going into the place of being able to take, taking everything that exists, finding a way to bring it closer together, um, and doing so in order to awaken and become more compassionate and wise. We want to do that. Why? We want to do that because where there is one person who is alive and awakened, there's the possibility for it to spread. There's the possibility because again, we're looming, you know, this weaving and warping, um, sutras, the threads of existence, everything begin, you know, it's like the thing, you know, you've heard about, you know, you pull on the sweater and the whole thing unravels because it's not just one thread where you pull one thread, you find that it's connected. So by resolving our sense of, of, um, of a separate self, right? Of I am separate from you, you are separate from me, etc. We begin to find, in fact, that we are not separate, that what one person does affects, you know, it's the butterfly effect, right? Just to pull from like pop culture here. You know, the butterfly flaps its wings and something happens, something shifts, something changes. So we, you know, what one person does affects so many others. So what we're trying to do then is find the way to resolve within ourselves that which is problematic, integrate it more fully in the name of compassion and wholeness in order to then accept and love those things in others. You know, again, it's widening circles, right? And, it, you know, it takes us further and further, you know, into that space. That's Tantra. Tantra is realizing that, you know, there is no escape. <laughs> There's no escape from reality. You know, you may leave this body, but then when you leave this body, you only find that you're, you're still a part of that entire structure. You're still a part of that loom. You're still woven into that existence, right? You're still integrated as a part of it. So if you're going to be a part of that loom anyway, then there's no way to get away from it. There's no other place to go. There's no other, you know, this idea of nowhere to go, nothing to do. That's just a way of pointing to there's no ability to escape the this interconnected, inter interbeing that we have with one another. We have to face it. We have to confront it. So then why does, you know, why are these... <laughs> Why are these, you know, why, why are we, where are we cutting heads off, right? And chopping up bodies and, and so forth in a chud practice. What's that all about? That's a good question. So by severing the attachment to the body, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're able to, again, get a bit, get a sense of a bigger picture by offering the body to, uh, to others, you know, we're awakening compassion, right? We're getting some distance. That's such an oversimplification of this whole thing. I don't even know where to begin, but I'm trying not to, you know, it's hard not to dive deeply into this because of this is what I, this is my practice, right? Um, in the practice that I do, the, in the chud practice specifically that I do, the um, trauma, what you do is you set your intention, you invite in your entire lineage to hold space for what's about to happen. And then you raise bodhicitta, you bring in um, profound uh, desire for the well being of all um, and, and the interconnectivity of all. And then you eject your consciousness out through the top of your head and re emerge as trauma, right? Um, trauma in, in the practice that I'm doing is actually wielding a skull cup 
and which I don't have, <clears throat> um, and a, a kartika, right, which are, are usually held like this or like this. Um, and what you then see is uh, you've left your body, it crumples to the ground, you're offering it as a mandala to the, um, to the divine, um, so you're supplicating to the divine, uh, and you're supplicating to all beings, all beings that have needs or pain, um, karmic debt holders, demons, um, whomever is suffering, okay, and you invite them, you call out using your, your conling and mine to put away in my bag because I've been uh, practicing in, in cemeteries and stuff lately, so I have it in my to-go to go bag. Um, but you, you know, you pull out your Kongling, you blow the Kongling, you let the beings of all, you know, of all, um, dimensions to know that they can come and feed on your corpse. And it's okay because you are protected at that moment, because at that moment you have merged your consciousness with that of trauma. So trauma and her fierceness protect you in this practice so that you may offer your body and then reemerge as yourself again. But having been through that skull cup, where is it? Here we go. Here's a great image. It's another Laura Shanti image, right? So your body is thrown in there. Um, and you see there that it's being transformed into this rainbow light, right? There's a lot of imagery here, but this is the basic essence of it. Okay. So... <clears throat> Once all of your 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 own stuff has been, you know, through that offering has been cooked and purified, it can then be offered to your guests. And your guests, again, are, you know, the divine, your lineage holders, your protectors, um, you know, the, the divine, the, um, you know, any karmic debt holders that you may have, any um, enemies that you may have, any people that you hold enmity toward, um, literal demons, um, you know, any, any being that has unmet needs, your corpse is transformed into whatever it is that they needed, right? Or whatever, it becomes like an amrita, it becomes a, um, a dutsi, a, a nectar, okay, that's then fed to them. And it's the perfect thing. It's the one thing they needed. You know, it's the love that they never got from their parent. It's the, um, you know, it's, it's the end, whatever it would, would, would satisfy them to the point that compassion could emerge and that they would need to, that they could stop feeding on the unhelpful things in their lives that cause them pain. Okay. That's it in a nutshell. And then once they're full and they're, they're like, oh, I feel so much better. I don't know what that, you know, whoo, that's nice. Woo wee. Um, then you offer the teachings of the Dharma and you invite those beings to be part of your, um, you know, to be an ally, essentially. You hope that they transform to an ally, to part of your Sangha, right? Um, and, it, and it is part of your being. We tend, of course, as human beings to project who we think someone is, right? Or who, what we think about something onto others, right? So we tend to either elevate someone as a god or we, we uh, denigrate them as a, as a form of a demon, okay? We're inviting all of them as aspects of ourselves to be fed, right? As self parts. So those of you who are into like Western psych psychology, parts psychology, again, which I, I spent more than 10 years practicing, um, as a, as a, um, I guess as a client, <laughs> um, as a, uh, as someone practicing, right. Uh, you know, as someone, um, working on themselves, right. Like how do I resolve all of these demons inside of myself? How do I resolve these parts? You know, those, that's what we're talking about here. It's the same kind of thing. So again, you can see that this is very complex. This is very complex, but the symbolism is the way in which we tap into those energies in order to bring them forth in ourselves. I hope that makes sense. Now, um, I feel like there's so much more to say about this as well. There always is, but if we look at, you know, you look at the ways in which, um, 
even the even the ways in which really uh, that the, these dakinis are depicted by um, by Laura Shanti, right? This is a very um, they're still pretty sexualized in some ways or could be viewed that way. This is a big problem in Tantra, right? Tantra is not utilizing sex as a way of, I don't know, as like as a se in a sex cult, Western puritanical Eurocentric uh, means that we tend to understand it in, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, so the yabyum, well, I'm sure we've got a yabyum in Laura Shanti's. I didn't pull them out. Um, the way that a, a yabyum is is a uh, a deity and their consort in sexual union with one another. Here we go. Okay, so this is the primordial uh, Buddha Vajra, Vajradhara and his consort, and she's got she's a dakini. She has a skull cup. Okay, and he's a Vajradhara. We know that because he's holding two two vajras, one in either hand. And what is she holding? She's just holding the skull cup so far as we can see. We don't see her other arm. Um, this becomes problematic in, in, Buddha, in, in understanding Buddhism. We're not worshiping sex. But this is what has been given to us as Westerners, right? As, as our understanding of Tantra because, you know, ignorance and white supremacy, basically. Um, you know, white, white scholars going into Tibet, understanding things in their, through their own filter without understanding the filter through which the culture is viewing something that is that is obviously profoundly important to them. Um, so what do we get? Let's see. Um, again, this is from the article that's that's linked below. Um, it says, quote, in the book, The History of Buddhist Thought, Edward Thomas wrote that Tantric Buddhism, quote, consists in giving a religious significance to the facts of sex. <sighs> Um, no. And that was 1951. That was 19. So that tells you a lot, right? It's a white guy going to Tibet thinking he understands and knows what's going on there. Oh, well, they clearly think this, right? That's not at all what it's about. Um, so this particular image is of a yabyum, right? What's called a yabyum. Um, and it is, it's representative of the wisdom Right, which is represented by femininity. Wisdom is regarded as a as an open, um, almost formless uh, means of um, what's the word I want here? It's it's well, it's feminine. It's yin, right? It's it's a very open, spacious, not easily pinpointed um, kind of thing. Okay, so by itself, it's it can be useful, but it becomes difficult to apply, right? So uh, then we have the other side of it, which is the masculine here. The masculine is representative of skillful means, okay? So it's the wisdom, which is so open and spacious and hard to pin down, united with skill, skillful means, which is masculine, which goes like that, right? So that's what we're pointing to. It's taking, you know, it's yin and yang, okay? And that, that Chi those Chinese Taoist principles are very much infused in the Tibetan as part of it. Um, and that, that sense of skillful means, right, um, which includes compassion, uh, is, it's represented in everything we do in Tibetan Buddhism. And most specifically, right, skillful means wisdom the bell and dorje so the masculine right this is the the dorje is held in the right hand the bell in which is the feminine it's the wisdom is held in the left hand skillful means and wisdom right or skillful means and compassion and wisdom so we could conflate or or not even conflate we could associate skillful means with compassion so that means that compassion isn't just a feeling it's not being nice. It's not uh, doing nice things. It's not, you know, it's, it's a way of applying something that's wise in such a way that it meets a need, right? Or that it, it serves a purpose. Um, 
that said, you know, gender is is unimportant in Tantra. So when we, I have a whole, where did they go? There they are. This is my, my um, mandala practices. Um, <clears throat> so we have, you know, an entire practice devoted to embodying um, all of these these deities, right? All of these Yabyum deities and their consorts in ourselves all at one time as a means of integrating all of our patterns, meeting them with, again, with wisdom and skillful means, okay? We also practice them separately. We also practice them as the mandala of the five Buddhas, right? Who are, although they're a little bit red in this depiction, they're essentially, uh, the, there's a little bit of white poking out where, right from under them that symbolizes a moon disc. So, so men or, or Buddhas are usually depicted in, in Tibetan Buddhism as being peaceful <clears throat> rather than wrathful, which means that they're depicted on a moon disc because the moon disc is peaceful. Little sip there. Okay, whereas the Dakinis, here we go, are depicted on something on fire, right, or yellow. You can kind of see that yellow where the bodies are that they're dancing on. Okay, and that is a sun disc, and sun discs are wrathful, okay, or they're, they're fierce. So we have that dichotomy going on there as well, right, within that, within this tradition. Always finding that balance, right, of masculine and feminine, of skillful means and compassion. So how are skillful means and compassion depicted in a fierce Dakini? And I would point out, too, in this, this Dakini uh, depiction, you can see the, this white Dakini, or the Buddha Dakini here in the middle. She's kind of ugly, right? And this, this is a, uh, an image that was... Um, how do I put this? How do I? Uh, it was commissioned by uh, Lama Girme, who is the the one of the lamas who does a lot of the artwork at Tara Mandala. And I think he painted this very specifically. These zakinis not to be sexualized. Okay, it's still possible. These are not, in my opinion, I don't find the zakinis in this deck to be particularly over sexualized. But given the way that our Western culture is, they easily could be. Because that's not what the focus is in the Dakini practice, Lama Girme um, painted them as as kind of kind of ugly, right? They're not intended to be beautiful. They're not intended to be sexualized. They're intended to represent the fierceness. Um, this this you know they're they are dark goddesses. They're um, the Dakinis are about. Um, well, they're, they're about fe the wisdom of fierceness, you know, of taking things, you know, being relentless. Um, there's, there's so much here. I, I don't even know where to begin. But hopefully you get the picture, right? Their depictions then, too, I should say, um, you know, in, in the practice itself, right, uh, we say specifically, right, become... The fierce, luminescent, dark blue Vajra Dakini. She stands on a sun disc. Let's find my... These are pretty good depictions of them. What's a fierce... Where is... Um, where's Vajra Dakini for crying out loud? There she is. Okay, so I'll, I'll hold this up while I'm reading this, right? Become the fierce, luminescent, blue, dark blue Vajra Dakini. She stands on a sun disc. On a blue lotus, although that's not a blue lotus, do you see? But there's a difference here clearly in the way in which, probably, that this practice is being utilized by Laura Shanti, right? So that's not necessarily a problem. It's just that it's a different tradition or it's a different lineage. That's probably better, a different lineage, okay? Um, with her right leg raised and her left leg extended in the dancing posture, surrounded by blazing wisdom flames. No wisdom flames here. Um... She holds the Vajra ornamented trigug, okay, which is the kartika, it's the knife, um, in her raised right hand. The skull cup of blood is held in her left hand at her heart. The katvanga staff, so she, the skull cup is representative of what's being transformed, okay? It's what's being transformed. Um, your very being, your very essence, 
the way that you are, what's in your blood, your DNA, right? Your patterns, your patterning, um, the way that you've learned to see the world, the way that you've taken in the world around you, that's being transformed. Um, then we get to the Katvanga staff, symbol of the hidden consort, skillful means and compassion, rests in the crook of her left arm, her three eyes of wisdom gaze into fathomless space. Now, that's just what's listed here in this, right, in the practice itself to, to jog the memory, right? The, we always include the depictions of the deities there so that we can be reminded again of their ornamentation. The ornamentation of a dakini is always to take bones, you know, they said they were said to have lived in um, graveyards and cemeteries and boneyards, um, you know, where the, where the dead are, are buried or transformed right through, through sky burial, etc. It's taking that which is ugly, taking that which is scary and learning to, to be peaceful with it, to begin to take it as an ornament to wear on yourself on your own body, right? To take that fear of death, um, the ugliness of a corpse, you know, the things we find most repulsive in our lives. So it's not just corpses, it's anything we find repulsive, anything we turn away from and find a way to wear that on the body symbolically. And as a part of the visualization of the Dakinis, to see that and be reminded of it is part of the practice. And it's also part of the way that you draw in the deities. It's the way you bring them to you, the way you bring that um, their energy. It's the way you call them, right? So then why is this not a problem, Right, we still have bones, but we don't have a Katvanga staff. She's not dancing. She, you know, the left, the right leg is not raised in the dancing position. There's no, um, there's no trigog. There's no, you know, it's she's doing a jazz splits in midair and flying upward. Dakinis are also traditionally depicted in this form. So Dakini means sky dancer. Right, they come from the sky. They come from the formless realm. So to me, when I look at this, I see a Dakini returning, you know, to the Sambhogakaya, which is the realm of energy and light. She's returning to the sky, you know, from which she came and, and returning to light. Here is a, um, this is an image of, that I did of, of a Dakini mandala right, with the white Dakini, it's always in the middle. And at that moment, it was being eclipsed by my own sense of darkness, right? So I used that image of the postage stamp. You know, they're also, they're, dem they're like balls of light. Um, so the Dakini can also be depicted that way, right, as, as that means. That's why we get the mandala. Okay, so this is um, Kali or Tromanangmo's mandala mansion. And so this holds the essence. These are bijas that call Tromanangmo. These are Tibetan. It should be pointed out as well. These are not um, written in Sanskrit. There are similarities in the languages, but they are obviously very different. Um, very different. So the sounds aren't even the same. Sounds for like Dorje and uh, Vajra, not, not even close. So as you can see, you know, this, this holds the essence. You're calling forth the essence of that deity, of that being, and it's a different type of practice. But again, you get this circular, round, formless. I'm calling from a space where there is no form. I understand that the form is something that I'm projecting onto that deity. But because I may be a lesser practitioner, right, or practitioner who needs that form in order to call the energy of that deity, this is a very advanced practice, right? 
because I'm maybe not that advanced, I need that imagery in order to understand the energy that I'm calling forth in the form of that deity. So there we go. In a nutshell, how long did that take? Good Lord. Almost as long as, as Queen Asset's video. So yeah, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, that is, that's the point. That's why the iconography is important. That's what we're drawing forth through, you know, what I'm drawing forth, what our practice draws forth, um, you know, the whole nine yards. The other challenge that uh, she offered, so there's going to be a part two. That's why I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this is this long. There is um, a part two to this because she threw out, you know, is there, are there any practitioners in the community who would want to come up with a spread for, um, for Kali? I would love to come up for, with a spread for Kali, you know, using their symbolism. I feel like I'm much more able to call forth a, um, a spread for trauma because I work with trauma. And so I thought it through and felt it out and was like, oh, yes, there are ways in which we could access what it is, you know, the wisdom of trauma, the energy of trauma, what her purpose is in our lives um, through a, a seven card spread, which I've scratched out very roughly here. Um, and in language, which is a little bit more spiritually mature than the language used in Alana Fairchild's spread. Um, and speaks very directly to Troma Nyangmo calling to her, which would be much more traditionally done than simply to address her kind of in this weird, you know, Eurocentric way of like, oh, divine mother. It's very new agey, right? Um, but if you're really wanting to access, and they, you know, uh, Queen Osset and Christina make this point beautifully in the video, if what you're wanting to do is access that energy very authentically, you call out. You know, when you ask, you know, Mother Mary to come help you, you don't say Divine Mother. You yell, you know, you know, Mary, come help me, right? It's it's not, you know, God, oh God, Jesus. You know, that's in a Western sense. You do the same. If you're really wanting to tap in, you do the same thing, you know. So that's where, that's where we call. And be careful because they're going to be honest. They're going to be honest. So part two, for the full moon, for the offering for the community, I'm going to um, pull it together <laughs> in a sense um, and offer a reading uh, with the spread and offer the spread to everyone as well. Um, yeah, and I'll see if I can pull it together in a form that's really helpful or useful on some level. So um, that's it. And that's a lot all by itself. Okay, so... Um, Thank you so much to Queen Osset and to Christina for such a wonderful video. Um, it obviously really inspired me and um, I found it fascinating, utterly fascinating. So thank you. And um, I will see you all again very soon.